Hello everyone, I am Crystal Hinkle and I am part of the team here, um, both that brought you Repair Shopper as well as Synchro. I just want to start off by saying thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are looking forward to this webinar. I We've got some really special things for you today. Um, so again, I'm Crystal and then I will let, we've also got Troy here as well as Andy. So I will go ahead and let Troy kind of give his little intro and background and Go for it, Troy. Hello, thanks. Um, so yeah, I guess um, I'm the founder of Repair Shopper. I, my background is I had a repair shop. I had um, a computer repair store with my wife and before that did computer repair, like um, just mobile, going to people's locations and stuff. Um, we did grow that store into three stores and then eventually um, started doing managed services. Um, did managed services at like a half a million dollars for a few years and learned a good amount about what's um, what's going on there and how to do that and a lot of what not to do. We never got super successful at it. Um, and then um, what got us here was my wife um, through some tricky negotiations with some of our big managed service clients got a little fed up with um, the managed service lifestyle and like particularly this one big mean client that was a little bit of a bully and was like you need to learn how to program so we can do other stuff and then um, started building what became repair shopper as an internal tool for our computer repair stores and then it kind of took off so lots more history that's the abbreviated version but um, that's what got me here awesome i love your little notes in the background too by the way oh. <laughs> be funny and say smart stuff. I love it. All right, go ahead, Andy. Hey guys, I'm Andy Cormier. Um, I've been in the MSP space for about five years. Um, interestingly enough, I didn't actually start off as an MSP. Um, when I started, if you would ask me five years ago, I don't even know what an MSP was at that time. Um, our primary business was consulting. We consulted for several hundred smart device manufacturers all over the world, which later transitioned into doing some consulting work for SAS companies. Um, that eventually touched on a lot of MSP adjacent services like CRM, help desk, uh, billing, POS stuff, things like that. And that kind of led us into the space that we're talking about today. Um, we really wanted to penetrate the MSP software space. We thought there was a lot of money there and we had a difficult time really understanding the needs, the wants, the needs, the pain points of MSP customers. So we actually decided to kind of quickly spin up an MSP ourselves without really knowing what the hell we were doing. Um, initially, we just expected it to be a loss leader or even just a break even so we could learn. Um, but what we did wind up learning turned out to be kind of a massive uh, a profit center for us. Um, when we first started moving over into managed services, which I think is where a lot of you folks are probably at at this point, something interesting, something to consider. Uh, we did a lot of research online and a lot of that research didn't wind up uh, resonating with us. It didn't make sense. Um, folks talking about just selling all you can eat contracts or never taking on hourly work, shunning residential services. It, it actually kind of sounded a lot like selling insurance to me. Um, you're gonna get some customer to come in, give you money every month for problems which they may or may not have while you do things in the background that they may not totally understand. And I'm not gonna lie to you, that's a, uh, a very tough sell overall. And don't get me wrong, um, that, that does make up a, a portion of every MSP's revenue, but the notion that all of it has to come from that style of managed services. It's, it's just not true. So we kind of threw out everything that we knew um, and we focused on, instead of trying to build an MSP based on what an MSP was supposed to be and then go finding customers that fit that model, we went off and found customers and modeled our MSP around them. So none of it actually began rooted in those concepts that I was just talking about before. And uh, we targeted everyone, big offices, small offices, retail, residential. Uh, we even went after QSRs, which is like uh, quick serve restaurants like McDonald's and uh, Burger King. Uh, we're out of Las Vegas, so we went after some smaller casinos too, just to kind of bring everybody under one roof and, and kind of really learn this business. And for me, it didn't matter how we build them, hourly contract, project work, it was all the same to me. And as hard as it was, we kind of took on all of these folks uh, simultaneously. And we quickly learned how to segment the most valuable customers in each group. And we quickly learned how to segment out the least profitable subsets of each one of those segments, which is kind of an extremely important concept that we'll talk about in a little bit. 
And then we eventually took what we learned and we started doing um, paid consulting work directly for MSPs themselves, several hundred over the past couple of years. Uh, when I sold my, well, the bulk of my MSP about a year ago, um, at our height, we were doing about two and a half million dollars of labor revenue annually. That was across myself and nine techs. And interestingly enough, about a million dollars of that revenue was actually hourly work. We never got rid of it. We always uh, welcomed it. And in fact, it became the premise of how we generated the bulk of our business contracts. Um, 20 to 30% of our business contracts wound up being generated from residential referrals. Uh, folks that had their own businesses themselves and we transitioned into that, referred us to their employers, um, outright uh, referred us to other businesses. So when you actually factor that in, uh, roughly two thirds of our global revenue was generated from hourly work, uh, which again is, is where most of you folks are at today. Uh, so anyhow, I met uh, the Synchro and Pair Shopper folks, Troy and the rest, uh, about a year and a half ago. Fell in love with their team, fell in love with their products, and uh, I've been working with them uh, just about full time ever since. Awesome. Thank you, Andy, for that. Um, so as you all can see, I think the purpose today is, is to not sit in front of you and say there is one way to do a certain thing. So what we're here to do today is if there, if you have questions about your break fix model and, and where you might want to see that go and you have specific questions, we're here to take those questions. So I have the Q&A open on another screen. So if you see me looking over here, I'm just kind of, I'm, that's probably what I'm looking at. So feel free to use the Q&A. It's the best way for us to kind of manage those questions as they come in. Um, but really, we just want to, again, there's not a, there's not a cookie cutter way to um, take your break fix business and move ahead or move forward or move in a different direction. So really, we're just going to kind of do this a little bit of an interview style. Um, so the first kind of question that I'd like, um, and whether Andy and Troy both want to address this one, but really, if we could just talk about what are the what are the major differences between break fix and managed services? What does that mean? What are the differences? I think Andy will be most of the talking today, but I'll definitely chime in where my experience seems to fit or where I want to dissent from his opinion. But yeah, Andy, you want to jump on this one? Sure. So the biggest thing, and it's kind of a big misnomer in the MSP world, is that the work is somehow different. Break fix work and managed services work is almost identical. It's not like a customer has a, a different kind of OS that only exists on managed services. It's, it's the same problems, the same work, the same day to day. There is three key differences uh, in managed services. One is how it's contractually structured. Uh, obviously, when you move away from or into, I should say, more contractual stuff and less hourly stuff, um, it's just handled a little bit differently. How you bill it is going to be handled a little bit differently as well. And then the work obviously skews a little bit more toward uh, proactive work versus reactive work. And a quick example is if uh, you have a, a customer that you've dealt with for years and their hard drive fills up, um, they call you, you fix it. It's a problem that happened, you you react to it, you go off and you fix it. With an MSP client, you most likely will have uh, some type of RMM like Synchro um, with agents that detect uh, these kinds of problems and you're gonna pick that up well before it ever becomes a problem for the customer and you'll take proactive action on it and let them know. And that either comes from a pool of uh, hours that they can use each month or, or however the contract is structured. But Again, same work, it's just really proactive versus reactive in, in how you're gonna structure and build that. Awesome, okay. Next next kind of question, and, and again, everyone that's here, if you have your own specific question, please pop that into the Q&A and we'll kind of be monitoring those as we go through. Uh, but the next thing that I was just gonna bring up is just if if you could give us some some examples of, of how to best leverage a break fix model um, to kind of break into the, those managed services. Yeah, sure. So I'm going to be super honest. I'm actually kind of envious of all you guys and where you get to start from where I had to start with a completely blank slate. Most of you folks are going to have a fairly large database of customers that you've built over the years. Um, and that's the best place to start. Virtually every customer that you guys have is a potential managed services client, or they could refer you to somebody who, who might be able to use these expanded scope of services that you guys are now considering offering. Um, so if you market to these existing customers, a lot of these are going to find it interesting because they've, they've done work with you, they trust you, they know you, and that gives you a leg up over all of the other competitors who are vying for that same business when you already have done work for these people, they already like you, you did good work for them, they're happy with you. 
So leverage that market, or excuse me, leverage that database and you want to segment them. You want to segment them, it may be more than this, but I would segment them in two ways. One would be customers that you're on a first name basis with. If they come in, they know you, you know them. And then everybody else, the folks that you had over the years that you might have just did one or two services for and they kind of fell off the map. Um, call the customers that you know and then email the ones or physically uh, mail the rest with like uh, EDDM, which is uh, every door direct mail through USPS or, or something to that extent. Um, anybody who is even halfway responsive to your inquiries, they become a hot lead instantly because again, you've done work for them in the past. So am I really saying that, hey, you can just go off and start selling managed services now? No, I'm not. Um, it's more about letting your customers know that you're expanding the scope of your services. You're no longer just the company that fixes a computer either on site or when they bring it to you. You can now do much more. You can protect them with antivirus. You can set up uh, cloud-based email for them, file staking, any of those kinds of things. Um, a, a very good way to get into this using today's current environment is that everybody wants to work from home and no one really has a very good handle outside of very large companies uh, how to do that efficiently. So you could easily uh, market by offering services like remotely accessing computers from home, file syncing services like Dropbox, uh, cloud-based email services like G Suite and Office 365. You're effectively selling them on the concept of a completely mobile workforce. And then most importantly, use that opportunity to learn, uh, to learn and almost teach them that their pain points go beyond their problems of today. So you're kind of marketing this on the basis of what you can do today but then you wanna turn these people into lifelong MSP clients by kind of showcasing what you can do tomorrow. Yes, today's problem is remote access. This is temporary. Look at all the things that I can do for you once we go beyond this point. So I think that's a, a great place for everybody to start. And again, uh, you guys kind of come at a significant advantage in that you do have this database of uh, existing clients that have already opened the wallet and given you money. Yeah, I think my, my answer to this isn't as full, but maybe just my experience going from BreakFix to MSP was I leveraged that model because just in that I had all these relationships with local businesses around town. So I was doing computer repair for residential and small business and I'd have, you know, my, my top five or 10 business clients that I was doing a few hundred dollars a month with to maybe $2,000 a month with at the time. And so I called those people up and was like, hey, I'm doing this new monthly offering. And I was chasing the, the recurring revenue, like silver bullet. Hey, we gotta get recurring revenue in to like um, make our business robust. But that's how I leveraged it. I made sure every business client that I talked to, I tried to get onto some agreement and we'll probably talk more about that later, but that was working for me. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And I think along the way, you kind of answered a few questions that I've got in the Q&A. Um, what's a good way to approach a break fix customer to show them the benefits of managed services. So I think that that one, I feel like you kind of um, touched on that. And then also kind of how do you approach without like that hard upselling type of mentality, it's, it's proving the value. And again, giving the examples of, of the current climate and different things you can offer them to help them out right now, as well as different managed services, antivirus, all of those things. Um, so I think a lot of that was answered. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I've got, good. So there's one in there that I'm dying to answer that actually, I think I want Andy to answer the um, underpriced one. Is that what you're looking at, Crystal? Yeah. Andy, yeah. There's a question from anonymous attendee advice for someone that has started down the MSP road, but has underpriced themselves, how to raise the price without losing them. And it says in parentheses, pumpkin plan. Um, I'll just say from my experience, I had underpriced a couple people um, and I ate it because it was only a couple hundred bucks a month and maybe I was losing a couple hundred bucks a month. And then um, I also thought I needed to standardize my price and have it be the same for everyone. And I think that was a failure. I should have analyzed their business, guessed at how much I was going to do, maybe even done a trial at break fix or something. And Andy is going to have a, a better answer. But what I did was jump in. Everyone's on an all you can eat contract immediately. And then um, I did end up running into that. And some of those worked out in my favor where I'd sell someone a thousand dollars a month thing and I'd only spend an hour every other month. Like you get, you can get lucky too. But um, that, that client ended up being really happy for many years. And the ones where 
I was, they were paying me $300 a month and getting a few hours of my time. We're also very happy. So, uh, Andy, what's your take on how to address that situation? Yeah, so without, without knowing more, that's, it's a bit of a tough one because I don't know if you're at capacity, for instance. Let's just say that you've got yourself in a tech and you guys are billing out 80 hours a week. Um, at that point, you have two options. You can expand or you can start to weed out the less profitable customers uh, in lieu of trading them up for more profitable customers. And when you first start off, it's inevitable that you're going to get, um, I don't want to use the term dogs necessarily, but you're going to get some contracts that just you screwed up on. You, you underestimated the amount of time they're going to use um, or, or you just wanted that deal so bad in the beginning that it made sense then and it makes not as much sense now. Um, so you really focus on, uh, one way to do it would be including additional services uh, as part of that monthly contract. So if right now, if you're billing them for monthly service and uh, monthly services like antivirus backups, things like that, you might consider telling them that you're moving all of your customers to uh, this new model where everything is included and it is a little bit more expensive and then it makes it a little bit uh, easier to swallow. But again, without knowing the, the specifics of where you're at, um, it, it, obviously if you're not billing on all your time, there's no such thing as undervalued time in my opinion, because for every hour you're not billing, you're losing money. Um, but it really does get very serious when you're at capacity and you have customers who are paying less than the bulk of your other customers. So if you've got a client you're just underwater on, can you think of a way to go have that conversation to fix that? Like you're in month three and you're completely underwater. How would you have that conversation? If it were me, I, I would actually eat it for the remain, assuming it's a 12 month agreement, I would eat it and then re up them after. I don't think it, I think you have very little chance of signing somebody on a, a long-term commitment, like a lifelong customer that you really want to create after three months and telling them that, Hey, you know, this isn't working out for me after I agreed that it would. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you do kind of have to work through it. Um, but again, there's always ways that if you find other areas of their business that initially wasn't discussed and that you could potentially get into, even if it varies wildly from the scope of services initially, you could even pitch that to them to help increase. Uh, yeah. I, I had that happen a couple of times. You could go pitch them a project. So um, maybe you're like outsourced help desk portion is upside down, but they desperately need like that server upgraded and a new, you know, backup system. Um, you can go lean into some of that stuff to try to make it a little more pleasant for the remainder of that contract. Yeah, Crystal, I don't want to throw you for a loop, but I don't know if it makes sense to go into the, uh, like the qualifying customers aspect. Cause I think it kind of builds on that for how to make sure that doesn't happen prior to it happening. I think, yeah, feel free to roll right in. We've got a lot of really good questions, but I think this is, important so yeah absolutely you can roll into we did have a question that was just what's the best way to qualify customers and why oh, it's important perfect. go for it so essentially and this is the if you guys get nothing else from this webinar today th this is really what i want you guys to focus on this is the most important aspect into expanding your services into uh into the msp space so it all revolves around the same question and it's always how do i price my services and this is going to sound real stupid and I apologize for that and I'll expand on it. But the simple answer is you don't. Um, every one of your customers is going to be unique. Every one of your contracts and the scope of services behind those contracts is going to be unique. Uh, the one thing that isn't unique is the amount of time you expect to spend with each customer. That's really what you're selling is time. It doesn't matter if it's contractual time, hourly time, project time. At the end of the day, all of that has to equate to dollars, regardless of circumstance. This becomes the basis for how you guys structure your business going forward. It's absolutely the most important metric you can work from. So you need to define what the minimum amount you and or your tech should be generating per hour in labor revenue. Is it $75, $100, $200 an hour? I don't care. It doesn't, it's what makes sense to you. And, and you can change that with time but you wanna go into every negotiation understanding what the minimum you wanna take is and why. And to figure that, you're just gonna multiply the assumed amount of hours for every customer you speak to by your hourly rate, your minimum hourly rate. And it's how many hours you feel the customer is going to consume, not necessarily how many hours you think you're going to work. And I'll explain why that's kind of an important difference. You could have what appears to be two fundamentally equal customers on paper. They have the same amount of employees, their office space is the same, same amount of computers on, uh, on site. Um, but one group, the office staff is extremely computer savvy and the other group, they're not computer savvy at all, which means one of those two clients is gonna become extremely needy. 
And they're going to generate far more service calls about simplistic things than the other group would, where they're probably just more calling when there's a serious event occurring. So are these two customers equal? No, they, they can't be. One's going to consume twice as much time as the other one. So that potentially means that the one that's, that's consuming a lot more time, that could actually bring you down to even half of what your minimum target revenue per hour would be. So as you become more efficient in qualifying customers, and that does come with time, um, you always want to strive to raise that minimum revenue level per hour. Maybe it's $75 today, but once things are really rip roar and you've got half a dozen techs on staff and you're constantly billing out all the hours, you, you want to slowly increase that and figure out ways where these customers are less profitable, less efficient. Does it make sense to keep them, change them onto contracts? It, it, it allows you to evaluate everything. And it really becomes a guide and a metric to tell you customers that are not worth it on a contractual basis before you ever sign them. So if you go to a customer and you figure they're gonna take 10 hours a month based on what you've uh, assumed about things that they're telling you, and you think you can sign them in a maximum of $500 a month, that client, unless you wanna work for 50 bucks an hour, that client really doesn't qualify for managed services, at least not today. So then you just make them an hourly pitch instead. And there is times when if they want managed services and that's all that they're willing to spend, you and this is a really hard one. It took me a long time to get over this, but you have to be willing to uh, convince yourself that not all customers are worth it. They're not all worth bringing on as managed services clients because you could easily get into a position where now all of your customers are $50 an hour, you know, on average, and you're doing that for the next 12 months because you signed a bunch of 12 month agreements. So always try and qualify people if possible with some kind of target revenue per or target labor revenue per hour if possible. It'll make everything infinitely more easy when you qualify customers and you pitch them contracts. Yeah, I want to I wanna underline this because someone else asked this in the chat and I think everyone's excited to hear. Like I see a lot of questions in forums online about like how did you start your pricing or how did you charge people? Um, and you just explained a model for it. What I was doing at the time was my labor rate for break fix was $100 an hour. So I was like, okay, even if it's the same with the managed service client for all you can eat, um, I'd love to have that contract with that recurring revenue where it's like guaranteed. So I'd say if they've got 20 computers and each person might need an hour of my time every other month, okay, I can charge them actually $50 a computer a month and still be making that $100 an hour probably mostly. So I'd and I started out actually trying to charge everyone $100 per machine per month, no matter who they were, because um, at the time I was talking to a Kaseya salesman signing up for Kaseya, because this is pre everything else. And um, he gave me a template for his managed service plan. And that's really how I got the idea, like what all you could eat was, or that I wanted to go do this. And um, after realizing what Andy just said, that if you, if you just analyze this person and target what if I just target a similar average labor rate to what I'm doing break fix, but now it's recurring and contracted. Like that could be an easy way to just start. You can start that today. Um, and yeah, it might be 40 bucks a machine. It might be 250 bucks a machine. But. Yeah. And I, there, there's a lot of questions just in regards to pricing. And so there's some, maybe you guys can touch on this just, um, a, I mean, there's there's questions on how to most efficiently bill customers, and if you are billing for cloud services, how do you how do you make sure you're billing for all of those cloud services if they change every month? Like, how are you doing that? How do you make sure you're collecting all of the things that you should be? Um, so there's billing stuff for a couple minutes. I think that's good. Um, I'll just share mine real quick. I I was like sold on a must do all you can eat, and then. Um, in the first one, I actually was including a lot of project work. And after that, I started realizing the project work, I could actually break out and I could tell someone, I'm going to do all you can eat, like help desk and tech support and basic maintenance. But if you like buy a new office and you want to move, I'm going to call that project work and that's not included. And that gives me a way to at least not get, you know, destroyed on those random projects that can come up time to time. And everyone was fine with that. So um, that's what I did. And then Andy has this experience with this super hybrid break fix hourly block hours stuff. And Andy, you want to talk about how you did sales? More yeah. tactically, like get into the weeds. What did your contract look like? 
what did you sell people? How did you estimate? How did you go on site to, did you go call on people or did you just email estimates out? Like get into some of the stuff. So, <clears throat> The first thing I'll say is that I, I find a lot of folks um, marketing to get leads initially. However you do that is fine. There's no wrong answer. Um, I mean, there is, if you find one is, is much more successful than another, but realistically a lead is a lead. You want to take the time to call them. If you can sit down with them, do whatever you can to get in front of them. Even if you have, you sit down with them, you come up with an estimate. Don't just send it to them and let them make assumptions, sit down with them and go everything, go over everything point by point. You should always be the expert in the room. And when it comes to someone else spending money, they need to believe that you're the expert in the room and just emailing an estimate really doesn't do that. Um, in terms of, of how you wanna structure billing, and I'm gonna make the assumption that, that almost everyone on this call is, is break fixed now and they're just considering expanding services. Um, a hybrid model is probably gonna be the most successful for everybody. And give me a second here, cause I've got, I, I broke my notes up differently, but, but essentially you're gonna to wanna to focus on what, what, what's called block hour contracts. Um, well, the all you can eat style, um, a, a lot of MSPs regard that as kind of like, regarded as kind of like the panacea of, of where you want to move everything into. I find block hour can be much more profitable and it also prevents you from getting into situations initially where you massively uh, under calculate a particular customer. So let's assume that I find a customer, they like me, I, I think I can do good for them and they're going to use, I guess, 10 hours a month. So my, my minimum target is a thousand bucks, um, about a hundred dollars an hour. And so that's what I'm going to pitch to them. Uh, I want to close this deal initially because I don't have a lot of contract deals. So I'm going to offer up right away my minimum. Um, once, once you get to that point, um, you can add on things in this block hour contract. So you can say this covers 10 hours a month and the way it works is it will expire at the end of each month. So if they use eight hours this month, uh, at the end of the month, it just gets wiped and next month they have another 10 to use. That prevents some weird month from all hell breaking loose and they use 30 hours in a month where if you're under an all you can eat contract, you would just have to eat those 20 hours. Now you can actually make money off those remaining 20 hours and then next month when things are back to normal, you keep on going the way you were going before. And then the key to that is, is that you guys can use block hours as a lure into getting people into contracts. So one example of that is that everyone never thinks about what they're paying. They always think about what they could potentially pay. So it's scary to somebody if you say, yeah, it's a thousand dollars a month, but it could be more. Well, they always want to know, oh my God, how much more, how bad could this get for me? So if they know that your hourly rate is a hundred dollars an hour, you can just increase above that at a discounted rate. So you can say, okay, a thousand dollars for the 10 hours a month, that should cover you for almost everything you need. If you want to guarantee you get it, say, well, I'll cover you for 12 hours a month. If you think they're only going to spend 10, who cares? You're going to, they're going to wipe two hours every month and not use it. But the critical part is that you can add in hours to that uh, at a discounted rate. So my normal rate is hundred bucks an hour. Any hour that you do in a month that goes over 10, I'll do it for 50 bucks an hour. I'll do it for 40 bucks an hour. It's almost like a, a sales vehicle. Like, oh my God, this is even a better deal. Cause if I go way above and beyond what I expected, I'm going to get a discount on my services. So in my opinion, that's the best way to start when you guys are first starting off. And I think that all you can eat is also a little bit risky in that, if you do underqualify a customer and think they're going to take 10 hours a month and they, they take 30, it's going to be 30 for the remainder of that contract duration. So you can kind of screw yourself a little bit in that regard, especially if you're just the one man shop or one man shop plus one tech. Um, you want to make sure that you're getting the maximum revenue per hour that you could possibly get. And all you can eat in the beginning is a way to ensure that that, that probably isn't going to happen. Yeah, that's really good. And um, you answered a lot of questions. There was several questions in regards to once those block hours are hit, do you charge more than your normal labor rate, but you're suggesting it would actually be a discounted labor rate instead of being more than the normal labor rate. Great. And if you guys, if uh, I guess one other quick thing I'll, I'll touch on here is that I'm, <laughs> I love money. I love making money. It's like everything I focus on in life. And any time that I'm doing nonsense on the back end, any kind of administrative stuff, paperwork makes me want to die because I'm not out making money. I'm out wasting time on this and it can't make me money. So a big part of this is finding a tool set that can encompass as many of these things together and save you time. And I'm going to bring up Synchro here really quick because it's a sister company to Repair Shopper and it's designed with a lot of these ideas uh, in place already. You can bill hourly, you can bill, bill all you can eat, you can bill block hour. And it, it can be structured in a lot of different ways where if you want to 
just bill your regularly hourly rate. You can do that. If you want to set one customer up where they're paying a thousand bucks a month and $85 an hour, $87 an hour, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It's all customizable within that platform. I saw another question in the Q and A about, um, how to easily manage a uh, bill for managed services. And that could be a, a paperwork nightmare, especially if you have a million people out there with, you know, just half a dozen licenses of office 365 or antivirus, and you're going up and down in a month and you're, you're, you're changing those things relatively quickly. You lose track. And eventually you look three months later and you're like, Oh my God, I didn't bill this person for five licenses or something. I've been paying for it for them. Um, and so that yeah, I want to touch on that billing stuff, billing automation. And, and, and that's when, when something like Synchro can help also because uh, they'll have a direct integration with Pax8, if you guys are familiar with that, who they resell a lot of these things like Office 365 licenses. We'll automatically pull the customer, find out how many... Uh, how can many you back up one level and not assume people know what Pax8 is and just explain what they do? Sure. They're, they're basically a, a tool set provider for MSP so you can resell licenses and the most common one is office 365 like business licenses for office desktop uh, emails and things like that and the direct integration will pull your customers and find out how many they have dynamically each month and bill from that it also opens up a, a whole other way of billing too that happens dynamically within synchro's invoicing system so troy took a different approach and he was basically billing per computer something that i've never done but Synchro allows for that by counting how many assets dynamically when you set up a recurring invoice and they'll say, okay, if I'm billing $50 for every asset, they have six. So I'm going to bill them 300 bucks. Next month, if it moves to eight, nine, 10, it just figures that out on the fly and automatically bills them the associated amount. So that was one of my favorite things when I first met Synchro was that I could set up all this crap that was just wasting my time day in and day out between QuickBooks and moving stuff over here and, and auditing stuff at the end of the day. I was like, you know what, if I jit myself 10 bucks, I don't care because it takes me more time to figure it out. Now I don't have to do anything. I set up recurring invoicing. I put credit cards on them if that's applicable. And then I never look at it again. The only time I have to do stuff is sending out individual invoices um, for hourly clients. It, it makes life so much easier. Yeah, I had that experience with Kaseya with one of my clients started growing like crazy. So they had 20 computers and by the end they had a thousand. And um, when during that growth, every single month I'd have to go figure out the next 20 machines to bill them. And, there was times when three or four months would go by and there'd be like a $2,000 makeup bill. And um, that automation is priceless. Um, and that's also in Repair Shopper, the recurring invoice line item based on an asset count. Um, it's good handy stuff. Um, Andy, what's the benefit of doing PAX 8 to sell Office 365 instead of just buying an account for each client? Like you get to make money presumably yeah, I mean, you, you make, I, I, and it depends obviously on volume. I think you make 15 or 17%. It's a, it's a decent markup on that stuff. But more importantly, it's, it's again, that, that you want to become the all-encompassing source for everything IT related. The more things that your customer pays for on a recurring basis is kind of a reminder that you're not the all-encompassing thing if you do IT and then they have 10 other bills for other IT services that you're providing for them. So I have always used, recurring services, and I'm not talking about labor revenue, I'm talking about backups and antivirus and things like that, as a lure into making more profitable contracts. So as a quick example, take antivirus. Um, it costs like a dollar an endpoint. It doesn't cost you really anything. So if I go up and sell a customer $50 of antivirus, well, whoopee for me, I make 40 bucks a month or something like that. But what you could do is you can, you can create a contract and take it to your customer and say, look, we believe in all encompassing things. So you have 10 computers. I'm going to cover you not just for 10 computers. I'm going to cover you for 20 computers. I want to cover your future growth. Your future growth is important to me. Well, today it still costs you 10 bucks for the licenses, whether or not they, they use them. That's what it costs you. As time goes on, if they do grow, fine, it costs you an extra dollar a month. But in turn, you can make that contract price seem uh, a better deal, even while you price it more expensive. Maybe you can add on $100 a month by including 10 email licenses and 10 antivirus licenses. Maybe it costs you 50 bucks, but you're gonna generate $100 of additional revenue from that. And by the way, that revenue is coming to you and it's coming to you forever. So again, the, the more sources that you allow your customer to pay for, it's just you're becoming much less of their single source of truth for all IT related services. So again, it's, it's not more to make money off it, it's more to use it to better your offerings and, and make your contracts look that much more interesting than people that you're probably competing against. Just put in the chat, Andy, if you're watching that, there's a few questions that um, 
I want to make sure we don't skip over and when we were brainstorming potential questions we didn't get around um, can I do this as a sole technician or I'm dealing with growing pains trying to offer MSP services with under three technicians um, can you do you have any ideas about how to do this as a solo or as just starting out or Thing. Yeah, when I first started out, I was solo. I mean, I had a lot of consultants on staff, but and they all thought I was crazy when I wanted to do this MSP thing. So I went off and did all the services. I wanted to be the one that talked to all of these different segments of customers and know what their problems were. I wanted to structure everything off of my own experiences and not the experiences of something I read online. So again, when you're just starting off, be very wary of time you're not spending. If you're already at 40 hours a week, uh, and you're billing 40 hours a week, great. That's when you can start to consider expanding. But when you're less than that, do what you have to do to fill up those hours. Um, the last thing you want to do is be earning $40 an hour because you're only billing 20 hours of your time. Um, I think the other biggest thing to do would be to try and convert some of your existing hourly clients to block hour contracts. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're trying to earn more money from them. It's that you're trying to solidify this as a permanent uh, revenue stream instead of one that might be, I mean, even if they average five hours a month, it still might be one hour this month and 10 hours next month. And as a, as a one-off uh, tech, that's really hard to judge. Cause if you have a lot of guys that do, you know, 10 hours next month, it, it kind of screws you. So usually if people are paying for those five hours a month, they're going to try and find, even if they're not having five hours worth of issues, they're going to try and find five hours of stuff free to do. And they're not going to want to go too far over that. So it, it helps you um, schedule properly. Um, and then if you also work with a good mix of, uh, of hybrid where you have some contract and some hourly, hourly customers become extremely valuable in the sense that if I sign somebody up for a contract, it doesn't matter how big or small this customer is, their problem is the biggest problem in the world and you have to fix it right now, right this second, because the world's ending for them. And that's because they're paying you money every month for their stuff to get fixed. If you have a residential customer that calls you, and you say, oh, I'll be over there today. They're like, oh my God, this is the greatest thing in the world. Like I can get a time anytime today. So the beauty of that is that while you're, you're scheduling your, uh, your block hour and contract clients first, you're going to find a lot of times when you go out, it's one o'clock in the afternoon, you spend half an hour fixing your, your contract client's problem. And then you have this other client at three o'clock hourly and you have this time in between and you're just wasting time. You can go back to the office and leave 10 minutes later so realistically, hourly clients let you fill those gaps to try and maximize your own time per technician. Um, they're, they're great for filling holes and that model only really works if you put both of them together. If you're all one or the other, you have to structure things a lot differently. So I, I highly recommend, um, and against what other people may say, embrace your hourly clients, always keep them, never lose them. Uh, they're the segue into everything else, but they're a critical part of so many aspects to growing your MSP. When you bring on your first tech, and they sold you on what they can do, I'm still kind of nervous about sending them to my best client and, and I always want to put my best foot forward. So I'll use residential clients to test these folks out and I'll call them afterwards. Hey, listen, I know we've done a lot of work for you in the past. Um, this is a new tech. I just want to make sure that he was okay. Was he professional? Did he fix your problem? Did he ask if you had any other problems? Um, it's a great way to test techs and it just, almost every aspect to you growing works so much better when you guys are, are hybrid. It doesn't matter if you're one, three, five, ten. Uh, it, it's all kind of the same concepts. Just trying feel to guilty about on. checking on. Don't feel guilty about checking on your tech's performance. It's just quality assurance. It's you got to do it. It's, it's no offense to them. Yes, I can say. Yeah. That. Um, that was a really great full answer. I think um, after hearing all the details you added, I I started to gel on like the simplest answer possible is actually. Um, I think it's just the same as doing break fix break fix as a sole technician, but maybe easier because you're probably gonna buy a tool that gives you remote access to these machines and you're gonna start getting new Intel. So you can be doing your normal thing and then you get an alert, something's going wrong. You get to know about it before everyone else does or you get to remote access a machine in a cool way. Um, so I, I think as a sole MSP at Synchro, we see a ton of those and I think that's totally doable. Yeah, and to build on what Troy said, um, it's something I call blending and this can be awesome for generating revenue. So you kind of have this world where if people are paying you on a contractual basis, um, you're kind of being proactive. And then there's a world where hourly clients are, are paying you to be reactive, but you can kind of merge those two worlds together to start generating additional sources of revenue. So as an example, there's always times when an hourly client may fix their own problem and put you out of the loop. So if they have a problem with their computer, 
maybe you could fix it in an hour. Maybe they don't know that. Maybe they just go to Best Buy and buy something on sale and you're completely out of that loop altogether. Because a product like Synchro lets you install agents on as many computers as you want at no cost, it's unlimited. I would start using that as a, as a tool to even break fix folks. If you guys have a shop, they come in your shop, you, you fix some kind of problem. Hey, would it be okay if I install this software? It's gonna monitor your computer for problems that you may not see. It'll give me a history and I'll know exactly what's going on. That way, if you do need a new computer, I know what to recommend, I know why to recommend it. But more importantly, you can kind of be pr uh, proactive with problems that you specifically search for. So I can go off and say, hey, uh, show me all the customer's clients whose user profile folder is less than 50 gigabytes. Then I can uh, merge all those together and market to them by saying, hey, we have cloud-based services. Did you know that if your hard drive goes down and they don't have this stuff backed up, you're gonna lose all of your information. So that becomes a way that you can take something that isn't necessarily broken and use it as an additional revenue stream. Uh, vice versa, you obviously don't wanna globally market that because you might hit somebody who's got two terabytes of cat pictures or dog pictures or something. And obviously you don't wanna lose money backing this stuff up. Uh, so it's a great way to proactively market to people and I call it micro-targeting, like you know what you're selling them because you have information that helps you do that. You know if their CPU is constantly at 100% usage because they have a crappy computer and they're trying to run Photoshop and, and you know whatever other programs they might be using on there that, that consume a ton of CPU. So yeah, oh, using the right tools to be able to bring this out is a huge help. I don't wanna sound like I'm selling anything, but that example is really cool about, um, that's been one of my favorite that you shared as an example. Andy, is that, um, user profile thing currently possible in Synchro, or you can create a marketing campaign around how much space someone's using? Yeah, so what you would do, and not, not to get real technical, because I know most of you guys haven't seen Synchro yet, but you can, one of the cool things about Synchro is that uh, you can do a lot of powerful things without having to spend like months through a university or hiring a consultant to set this up for you. So you can set up custom fields on asset and custom, uh, customer records, and then you can run scripts perpetually that update those fields. So what I did is I ran a script on everybody's uh, computer that said, hey, scan their user profile folder, get a total size and put that in this field. And then you can say, I wanna make a view of everybody's user profile folder that's bigger than this particular number. And they had, there's a mailer feature built right into Synchro that lets you market to folks. And you can actually take that saved search and only market to those people. So it's like a dynamic way to target people, um, but it's always very specific to what you're doing. So you can have 20 marketing campaigns like that, just micro targeting specific elements of what people are doing. And you'll find that you're gonna close a lot more hourly work that just didn't exist before. It's not work that you missed, it's work that your current model just wouldn't allow for because you had no in into this additional pieces of information. You had no additional ways to qualify these folks. You can literally run a script that can put people in and out of a marketer campaign and then fire that off dynamically. Um, there's a question here that seems like it could be timely saying, what is the benefit of one RMM versus the other? Can you pretend to be unbiased for a minute, Andy, and just talk about how you evaluate an RMM? Yeah. So when I first started out, I spent months and months with every single one. I was obsessed with efficiency because I knew how that ultimately would, would change the scope of business, especially if I really grew up. And ultimately the one thing I settled on, and it wasn't actually until I, I first met Synchro, um, and there's other products that do this okay too. It's who is gonna make you the most efficient and what product do I spend the least amount of time with little dippy things every single day that I have to do manually. So the first thing to take into account is, and I'm just, I don't normally like saying you have to do this, but this is one of those instances where I think I'm going to. You really have to have an RMM, which is the remote management part that's installing assets on people's computers and monitoring them and running scripts and things. And the PSA component, which is, the invoicing, the billing, the all the stuff we were talking about before about dynamically billing against a set amount of assets or a set amount of contacts, employees, whatever it is. Both of those have to be within the same system. If they're not within the same system, you wind up with an okay PSA, an okay RMM, and then you're basically limited to the amount of functionality that one, one essentially talks to the other. If it doesn't do XYZ, your entire platform no longer does XYZ. The other thing that, that really kills me is the amount of time you have to spend physically going onto another platform and learning it. And with Synchro, you could come from any other platform in Synchro and you could set up the majority of your processes within a day, especially if you have a lot. There's other ones like I, I spent a lot of time on uh, ConnectWise Automate because when I first came on, 
uh, as an MSP, everybody was like, oh, if you're a real MSP, if you really want to get going, that's the product to use. They're the biggest, they have the most features. And I'll be very honest with you, they are the biggest and they have the most features. And after six months with them, I know how to use 10% of them. And that's the problem with it is that features don't matter if you can't make money from it, if it doesn't make your life better. And what a lot of folks wound up doing was hiring consultants and you don't really know what you need at the beginning. And that's the problem. So you need it. It's kind of like the iPhone model. If I went off and got an Android, I can do twice as many things as I can with my iPhone, but I can spin up an iPhone and use 80% of the functionality today. And, and I think that's what I'd look for when you're vending other products. There's some that are flashy. There's some that look really poor, but do a lot of functionality. It, it really just comes down to how quickly can you get spun up? And more importantly, as you grow, is this product going to grow with you? Because I find that happen a lot where people play switcheroo with, with their RMM every three months because this did everything I thought I was going to need today. And then tomorrow there's like 20 more ways I thought to make money and it doesn't do it. So you just need to find something that's flexible, that's going to grow with you. And that has the power to essentially give you the tools to do anything you want, even if you don't know what they are today. And that's more important than a lot of fixed functionality that you may never actually learn how to use at all. Andy, while you were talking, I think you generated a bunch of questions that are also relevant. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Crystal, if you had content you're trying to steer us to, but there was like three or more questions just now about what's the difference between Repair Shopper and Synchro? When would you use one or the other? Um, I wrote answers on a couple of those. Um, the short version from, in my perspective, is Synchro is Repair Shopper plus the RMM and MSP-centric. Um, I also could imagine there's a bunch of people on here that aren't familiar with what an RMM is. Andy, do you want to take a stab at just defining RMM or telling people yeah, what is this other thing that's in Synchro? What does it do? And maybe we can spend a couple minutes on this. Just Yeah, uh, it's essentially an agent that you just kind of like uh, antivirus. We'll call that an agent. You install it on the machine, it does stuff. So the stuff that this can do is uh, primarily uh, is run actions and scripts. And then the second component of that is monitoring. So for instance, if the computer, your customer has a computer and it starts blue screening consistently, you can monitor for that. And then you can throw alerts to yourself or to your technicians and say, this is potentially a problem that's happening. If it's with a paid customer who's paying me uh, contractually, um, we need to go off and fix this right now. Um, if it's an hourly customer, I want to go tell them that, hey, we're seeing this behavior. Is this something you want us to take a look at for obviously for paid work? Um, that's kind of the monitoring capacity of it. And then scripts can either behave as like a precursor to stuff or it can be reaction to stuff. For instance, if I'm tracking a customer and I want to, I want to see if their hard drive space starts to get low, the first thing I can do is if it throws an alert, I can have that alert then run a script automatically. I don't have to do anything to do this. And it's going to go off and it's going to clean up all the temporary files on the machine. Maybe it's a ton. Maybe they haven't done it in six months and that fixes the problem and the alert closes itself and I don't have to do anything else. Um, so it's essentially monitoring of assets and it's uh, taking action against assets. And the key to that is it's doing it in an automated way. And then you can go beyond that and it, it's very useful for troubleshooting as well. For instance, there's a component of a uh, uh, synchro and this is, this exists in different fashions in a lot of uh, RMM products. I call them backgrounding tools. So I could go in there and I could see like the task manager without the, without popping it up on the customer's desktop. I could get into the command prompt. I could look in the event viewer, registry, whatever it is. And I could look in the file structure and it, it allows you to kind of do some remote forensics in the background without having to interrupt the user's work. And that can become massively beneficial, especially with the right customer. Um, I had certain customers where they were retail oriented, for instance, and they had a boatload of POS terminals and they get busy like at lunchtime or, or certain times of the day. Well, I couldn't hop on the computer remotely and fix problems, but I could certainly do it with utilizing these background tools and scripts and things of that nature. Um, and then the, the, the nice thing about, I guess if you're talking about what's the difference with a repair shop or in synchro, um, it is what you just said, but it, it's also that they're bo both of those tools, the PSA and the RMM, they exist in one interface, not just like, two separate products that we bought and they somehow talk to each other, they're the same interface. You don't leave this single pane of glass to do anything. And that becomes extremely beneficial. For instance, um, I don't have to have an outsourced ticket system that then I have to manually figure out how much time has to do these things. You guys are doing that now with a repair shopper, but it's much more interesting when you can integrate that with asset work. So as an example, I can have a script that does something in the middle of the night, it finds a problem, it times how long it takes to fix that problem, it can actually open a ticket for me, add time to the ticket, 
close the ticket and I actually wake up and I have tickets of build time that I didn't even know what was going on. I'm like, oh, they had a temporary space, had to get cleaned up. I build them for half an hour. This is awesome. I click invoice and I'm done. That's the power of a system like this. And, and that's the kind of things that I think I'd really focus on, especially when you're just starting off. Efficiency is everything. And if the product doesn't have all of this stuff in one, it's not efficient no matter how big they are and how many features they offer. I think it's also just worth mentioning and throwing this out there too, because we talk about, you know, these big powerful platforms that are very difficult to learn. Whereas like we have a very simple and clear migration path from Repair Shopper to Synchro. So if that was a transition you were looking to make, you're already over halfway through the battle of of that type of migration you don't have to retrain techs on a, a full new psa system everything is there it's going to stay intuitive for you easy to learn easy to transition and again we do have a clear migration path for you there so just wanted to kind of throw that out there as well yeah um, um, and specifically your entire history everything 100 percent comes over it, like nothing is left behind Maybe there's a couple features that don't work, but it's a very short list. But like whole ticket history, whole invoice history, everything comes over. Yeah, and those and those um, like accounting system integrations that you have, you don't even have to think about resetting that up. It's like a re you reauthenticate it and it's good to go. Um, and so yeah, the the benefits of of thinking about that transition, um, we can definitely I think combat some of those fears with that type of a migration. Yeah, and the one other one other thing I'll, I'll speak to when you're when you're evaluating RMMs is always think about two things. Think about your cost today, and then think about your cost tomorrow. And one thing I can never stand personally, it's almost like going into the the mall at the pretzel place that like cuts the dough, and they want to weigh it to make sure they don't give me too much. You know, I I can't stand that. And it's the same concept here where most RMMs are going to charge you per asset. So theoretically, as you grow, you're getting penalized for growth. There's a few out there, including Synchro, that charges you by the technician. So when you're just starting off, for whatever it is, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Troy, I think it's $110 a month, $100 a month, something like that. But whatever that cost per tech is, it entails unlimited assets. Grow as big as you want. And the beauty of that is, is that when you have unlimited assets, this is exactly what I did. Every single customer I went to, even if it was just a one-off that I probably would never talk to again, I was talking about putting this agent on there, and I could do it at no cost to me. But if you've got 100 customers like that and you're paying, you know, three bucks an asset on a different platform, well, now it's costing you $300 a month to hope that you can generate additional service from that. So that's another big aspect of it is, is what is it actually going to cost you in the long run? And more importantly, what's it going to cost you when you grow drastically, which is obviously the hope for everyone. All right. What do you got, Troy? No? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to continue to to scan the Q&A. One of the ones I know when we were kind of prepping for this that we wanted to make sure that we talked about was um, just the idea of automated billing, just in general, the idea of automated billing and owning essentially owning those credit cards. And so I, I definitely want to take some time to to talk about that. Yeah, sure. So th this is going to be a, a super weird concept if you're not familiar with it, but I, I'm going to go into it. So as I've been talking about, you're going you're to hear me say this a lot, that efficiency is the key to success in this space. It just is. The more time you have for, for making money, the less time spending on, on nonsense things. So I often find when we would consult for MSPs that they would go off and try to find ways to circumvent customers that wanted to pay by a credit card. They're, they're willing to give you the card. They're willing to have you store a bill against that. And they were very concerned about this very small fee, the 2.5%, 2.9%, whatever it is, in lieu of trying to use segregated systems to do something like ACH. So if you have a contract for 500 bucks a month, I don't know what that costs you at 2.5%, 12 bucks, 12.50, whatever it is. And you're, you're saving $12.50 to go off and spend an hour trying to every month get all this data, bring it in here, make sure it matches audited. I don't know how else to say this other than just embrace that two and a half percent fee, learn to love it. Put that credit card on file, even if it's only a residential customer that, that bills you, you're billing them $5 a month for antivirus. Get the credit card and keep that credit card on file. It's a constant reminder that you are their IT service provider. You're not just the company that fixed their broken computer once, you're the company that keeps things running. And if you want a very good example of where this is used in the marketplace today, 
Apple has utilized this concept for over a decade. I don't know if you guys are iPhone users and use iCloud, but they bill me like 99 cents a month happily on my credit card every month for iCloud storage. In fact, they don't even have an annual option. They want you to know that they're not just the company that's providing you cloud storage. That credit card becomes a gateway into every other service that's encompassed within their ecosystem. And it's all available because you have that credit card on file. So your customers are no different. And I can't speak enough to setting up a bunch of recurring invoices, charging it against a credit card you have on file, and never doing anything. You have to match the money to your bank account and that's it. I don't have to send the invoice. I don't have to click charge a credit card. I don't have to do anything. So I made sure that every one of my customers, whether they were hourly or they were contractual, we had their credit card on file so long as they were okay with that. I can't tell you the amount of time we would go to a, a customer's site, they'd have a problem for a half an hour and they're like, geez, can you stay another hour? Just put it on my credit card. Yeah, no problem. It's the same way we shop with credit cards as the way people uh, shop for services with credit cards. They're gonna spend more money. So again, embrace credit cards, learn to love them, love that fee because it's gonna become a gateway to infinitely more revenue for you guys overall. Awesome. Thank you. Um, as I look through, you know, a few of these Q and A's, I know obviously a lot of you are using Repair Shopper, love Repair Shopper, also very intrigued of this idea and what Synchro looks like. And um, just wanted to kind of say out loud, like that there is a difference in pricing structure. And if you have any sort of questions about that, please just, um, you can directly shoot me an email. It's just crystal at synchro msp.com. I'll put that in the chat box too. So if you do have any pricing questions like that, please just reach out. Um, also, I'm just gonna throw this out there as well. Synchro does have a full, um, 30 day free trial. If you just want to check it out, we'll provide a demo for you and all of those things too, if you kind of want to dive in and, um, just play around with it also. Um, all right, so I think the next thing is, um, since we are somewhat running out of time, but I don't have anything right after this, so if we can maybe touch on a few additional questions, I think one really valuable um, topic is just what, what are the next steps? Like what could you do today and what does that look like? Um, so I'd love to, to hear thoughts on that one. Yeah, sure. So kind of starting back at the beginning, um, you guys have this great customer database, theoretically. Um, you should be segmenting them like we talked about before. Um, and keep in mind that even if you get a low response initially, it, it's not necessarily important that they don't have a service that you could provide them today. It's important that they know that you've expanded your scope of services and you could provide service for them potentially tomorrow or to anybody that they happen to refer. Um, another thing that, that you guys can do in general, um, and this can just help improve revenue overall, is you can teach your on-site techs who are going out and doing calls um, how to obtain more information to help you micro-target these folks. For instance, are they a Windows household or an Apple household? Um, do they use TV streaming services like Apple TV or Fire TV? Do they know that they could cut the cord on cable and save a bunch of money? How many computers do they have on site? How many children do they have? And I know that that last one sounds a little strange, but you can get into a concept of, we can offer you DNS filtering, which like WebRoot offers and Bitdefender offers. And we can make sure that your kids are protected online, that their online identity isn't, um, uh, isn't compromised. Um, that kind of stuff really sells. And again, it's about generating more revenue from folks than you are today. It's not that more things are breaking, it's that, you're now providing these folks more services. You're becoming a more all-encompassing company. And if you can do that with hourly clients that are businesses, it becomes much easier to sell a, a contractual uh, arrangement when you increase their two hours a month to five just because you're offering them more hourly services each month that they're buying into. Um, and then I guess one, once you, and it may take you three, six, 12 months to, to fully go through your existing client database to market the services you have. But once you go beyond that, um, a lot of it does involve marketing. And this is an area a lot of folks are scared of. They don't like cold calling. They don't like sending out mailers. They, they feel as though they're spam. But again, it, it's more about trying to ensure that you know how to target the right folks, target the right demographics. Um, when I first started, I, I wanted to do half my business residential just because everyone said you shouldn't do that. So I was like, I'm going to try to do this and see what happens. And 
we learned places to market to and not to market to by targeting everybody initially. Um, for instance, uh, if you guys are familiar with some of the higher end, um, like Amplify from Ubiqu Ubiquity, that, and Linksys and stuff are starting to do these like really high end Wi-Fi systems that will cover, you know, 5,000 square foot homes. Well, we started marketing stuff like that. We found obviously the, the bigger homes were contacting us and we were getting no feedback from homes that were townhomes and primarily condos and things like that. So by understanding like how to target to the right demographic made a whole lot of sense for us. And, and it really transformed our marketing efforts. Um, one quick example that I can give that we did fantastic with was um, we tried to focus on residential clients that were very close to our office. Um, we initially marketed to all of Las Vegas and then we, we found that we would get a customer for a one-off service an hour away and now that one hour service took us three hours of our time. So we used, uh, like, like I mentioned before, every door direct mail um, and that can be micro-targeted. You can market by any kind of demographic and it worked on mail route. It wasn't like just send it to all Las Vegas. So you could be very picky about who you wanted to target to and run A-B testing and stuff like that. And we started marketing to... Um, very high end uh, 55 plus communities. And that was actually one of our greatest sources of revenue and actually probably my favorite customer of all time because these folks, they were, most of them weren't very tech savvy but they were very smart individuals and a lot of them had businesses themselves, their kids had businesses, they became a great source of, of uh, referrals and a great source of just recurring revenue because once they knew that you could fix problems and improve their day to day lives, it was just constantly, constantly getting calls from these folks for anything. They didn't care how small it was because they didn't care about the $100 service charge when we went over to fix a problem. And then if you kind of contrast that with marketing to millennials, as an example, those folks are typically very tech savvy. So they may not be calling you for every, every little thing. And, and most likely they're going to be fixing a lot of their own problems. So they may be much less interested about your, your $75 an hour service. So again, once you start to get into anything that's beyond your core customer base, just keep in mind that you really want to be able to segment those people and micro target what you're selling uh, services based um, based on those demographics. Wonderful. You have anything to add to that one, Troy? I was going to. No, I'm over here typing an answer to this question about what would be your first three steps in determining a pricing structure. So I'm, I'm okay. almost done typing up an answer, but awesome. I also I'd love Andy to touch on that one if you feel like it. Andy, if you have I mean, two techs in the shop and wanted to start offering MSP services, what are the first three steps you take in determining pricing structure? So go back to what I said before. I mean, if all you're doing is hourly work, you have a very good idea of what you're doing in terms of, of revenue. You know how much time, even though you're billing for an hour, maybe your average service is only 45 minutes. So that, that has to get uh, factored into the equation. So if you know what you're generating now per technician, you're happy with that that becomes your basis for the minimum you're going to charge based on the time you believe it's going to be hourly work. So again, I would recommend staying away from any kind of fixed, uh, fixed pricing, fixed by asset, fixed by customer, fixed by employee, whatever it is, and just focus on initially, this is how many hours I suspect this customer is going to use. This is the minimum I want to get. And then per hour, and then getting that number as high as you possibly can get it. Um, and obviously you can get more, I don't know if I want to use the word brazen, but, you can take more risks when you have a bunch of closed clients. Obviously, if you're trying to close your first one, close it. Close it at your minimum. Close it at 10% higher than your minimum. But as you go along, you know, if I have five hours left and I'm billing out 35 hours a week of a 40-hour work week, then I'm going to want to maximize that last remaining five hours. It doesn't mean I just want it to sit empty forever. But at the same time, if I can go get somebody for 150 an hour instead of 100, I'm going to do that. And then I'm either going to make the decision to expand or start to lock off some of the less profitable customers in lieu of the ones that are more profitable. So it, it all really comes down to that, how much money am I making today an hour per tech? And is that okay to keep doing in the future? And then that becomes your metric for growth and everything you do from, from there on out. Awesome. Okay. Well, we're four minutes past the hour. I think um, I'll just say if you if you have any additional questions or if there was any questions that we didn't get to, please feel free to shoot me an email, um, crystal at, and it's either secret MSP or repair shopper. Um, let me know uh, how we can help. Again, um, there's free trials on the synchro side, but if you just have questions based upon what we talked about today, also this has been recorded and will be sent out to everyone that 
registered as well as probably posted on the Facebook page. Um, so if you missed any part of it, we'll be able to get that recording to you. Um, but I just want to end by saying thank you so much for everybody that attended. We really hope that you found this helpful. Um, keep letting us know if there's anything you need or anything that or more information that you'd like us to provide. But thank you so much. And thank you, Troy. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for having everybody. Thanks everyone for the awesome questions. That makes this really fun. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.